This first section discusses the elements of the geometric algebra G3, its members, the objects in it. They're called multivectors, and there are four basic kinds, scalars, vectors, bivectors, trivectors. And you see at the top that they are the topic of the next four subsections. Each of the four kinds has a size and an orientation. Let's take them in turn. Scalars. A scalar is an oriented magnitude. I plotted the scalar s on the real line. A scalar has a size, its absolute value, and it has an orientation. It can be bigger than zero or less than zero. No orientation is assigned to the scalar zero. Now scalars are round in R3. They multiply vectors. Scalar multiplication but scalars are not elements of R3. The only elements of R3 are its vectors. Vectors. A vector is an oriented segment of a line. You see one illustrated. A vector has a size, its length, and it has an orientation given by an arrowhead at one of the two ends of the line segment. A vector is considered unchanged if it's moved parallel to itself. Note that vectors are one-dimensional objects. They may live in three dimensions, but they themselves are one-dimensional. Bivectors. A bivector is an oriented segment of a plane. I've indicated the plane in the diagram with a parallelogram and placed the bivector B in it. A bivector has a size, its area, and an orientation given by an arrowhead around the boundary. The arrowhead gives the bivector a counterclockwise orientation in the figure. Flipping the arrow, flipping the arrow would give it a clockwise orientation. The bivector is considered unchanged if it's moved parallel to itself, rotated in its plane, or even reshaped as long as the area is retained. To illustrate this last point, I started with a circle indicating a bivector. I've squared the circle, giving a square with the same area as the circle. I've given the two figures the same orientation. Those, ve those bivectors are considered equal. Bivectors have no shape. Bivector operations. There are two arithmetic operations defined on bivectors. First, there's scalar multiplication. One can multiply a bivector by a scalar to obtain a new bivector. I've started with a bivector b on the left, and then I've multiplied it by 2 to obtain 2b. 2b has twice the area as b, and the same orientation. If instead I multiply by minus 2, I again get a bivector with twice the area as b, but the opposite orientation. Similar things happen multiplying by a half and by minus a half. One can also add bivectors. The construction is a little complicated and I choose not to give it here. The important point is that bivectors with scalar multiplication and bivector addition form a vector space. Let's recall what this means. Vector spaces. The notion of a vector is not limited to oriented line segments. The general concept is that of a vector space. A vector space is any, any set of objects, I'll denote them here P, Q, R, satisfying the following. Scalar multiplication and vector addition must be defined. There must be a special object zero, and the following rules, axioms, must be true. Here's a list of them. They should be familiar to you.
I've arranged them so that 1 through 3 apply to addition, 4 through 6 apply to scalar multiplication, and 7 and 8 apply to the interaction between the two operations. Now, the reason that the notion of a vector space is important is, as soon as you have a vector space, you have the various vector space concepts, linear independence, subspace, dimension, basis, and so on. So if I tell you that the space of bivectors, the set of bivectors, forms a vector space, then we can talk about these concepts. For example, I can tell you that two bivectors, one in the xy plane and the other in the yz plane, are linearly independent. I can tell you that the dimension of the vector space of bivectors is 3. Trivectors. A trivector is an oriented segment of space. You see a three-dimensional object T, a trivector. Trivectors have a size, their volume, and they have an orientation. They can be left or right-handed, just as coordinate axes can be left or right-handed. A trivector is considered unchanged if it's moved, if it's rotated, or even if it's reshaped as long as the volume is retained. A scalar multiplication can be defined. To multiply the trivector t by the scalar c, I multiply its volume by c, and I flip the orientation if c happens to be negative. One can also add two trivectors, and under these two operations, the trivectors form a vector space. The crucial fact about the vector space of trivectors is that it's of dimension 1. To see this, I'll show that every trivector t is a scalar multiple of a given non-zero trivector. So, suppose I have t naught and you give me t. I will multiply t naught by a suitable scalar to bring its volume equal to that of t. If t is of the, is of the same orientation as t naught, then I'll use a positive scalar. If it's of the opposite orientation, then I'll use a negative scalar. These highest dimensional objects in G3 are called pseudoscalars. They have dimension 1. The vector space G3. We've now seen the four basic kinds of multivectors in G3. Scalars, vectors, bivectors, trivectors. It's time to put them together into the vector space G3. The objects in G3 are the form a scalar plus a vector plus a bivector plus a trivector, forming the most general multivector in G3. Notice that V is a vector and also a multivector. Now, the sum forming M is not like the sum of two vectors, U and V, to form the vector W. If I have W, I cannot recover U and V. On the other hand, if I have this M, I can recover its, this scalar, the vector, the bivector, and the trivector. They are called the parts of M. It's, it's rather like a complex number being formed of a real A and a pure imaginary BI. The complex number, Z, is usually considered as a single object, but its real part A and its imaginary part B can be recovered. Theorem. The multivectors in G3 form a vector space. What does this mean? Well, first of all, it means that there are two operations, scalar multiplication and multivector addition, that can be performed. To multiply this, this multivector by a scalar, 
I multiply each of its four parts by the scalar. If I have another multivector n down here with its own scalar vector, bivector, and trivector parts, I can add m and n by adding the scalar parts, the vector parts, the bivector parts, and the trivector parts. Under these two operations, the multivectors in G3 form a vector space. A G3 basis. The vector space G3 has lots of bases, just like the vector space R3 has lots of bases. But if we start with an orthonormal basis for R3, then one can construct a canonical basis for G3. It looks like this. First, the scalar 1 forms a basis for the scalars in G3. Any scalar can be obtained by multiplying 1 by that scalar. The three vectors, E1, E2, E3, form a basis for the vectors in G3. These three bivectors form a basis for the bivectors in G3. For example, E1 outer E2 is represented by a parallelogram with sides E1 and E2. Well, that's a unit square uh, with sides 1 in the xy plane. This is represented by a unit square in the xz plane, and this a unit square in the E to E3 plane. This trivector forms a basis for the trivectors in G3. We know that the trivectors form a vector space of dimension 1, and therefore we expect a single trivector here. The outer product represents a parallelopiped with sides E1, E2, E3, that amounts to a unit cube in three dimensions. What about the dimension of the vector space G3? Well, let's add them up. Uh, one for scalars, three for vectors, three for bivectors, and one for trivectors for a total of eight. The dimension of the vector space G3 is eight. And that's 2 cubed. The 3 here comes from the fact that we're working in 3D.